Welcome to Thursdays at the Museum. I'm Ian Rathnicki. Thanks for joining us for the program today. Today's talk marks the end of our virtual Thursdays at the Museum program as we know it, but we hope you'll go to the museum and visit some of the objects we've explored in these talks over the last few years. And while you're there, you can talk to our incredible volunteers face to face. Uh, general admission is always free for residents in Wayne, Oakland, and Macomb County, so please come visit. Uh, but today's talk is about the history of the DIA, and here to tell you about it are a few of our volunteer docents, Tana Jenkins, Joel Stern, Dave Galley, and Ray Henney, with assistance from Kathleen McBroom, who's managing the slides for us today. Thanks, Kathleen. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question, while we're live today, you can do so by signing into YouTube and leaving a comment there. Or if you're watching on Facebook Live, you can leave a public comment there as well. And your questions will be fielded by DIA's Manager of Volunteer Development, Christine Mark. Uh, but let's get started. Uh, let's welcome Tana, Joel, Dave, and Ray. How Thanks, you doing? Ian. Appreciate it. Yep. Hello, Joel, Tana. Dave, you hey look guys. great. Hi. You just look great, Dave. You really do. <laughs> <laughs> so does your so, so today we are delighted to share a virtual presentation about one of the most renowned art museums in the world, your own Detroit Institute of Art. The history of the DIA spans over nearly 140 years, and that history is distinguished by an accumulation of a world-class collection extraordinary innovations, and a commitment to being a visitor center museum. Indeed, one of the museum's groundbreaking accomplishments is the subject of a current exhibition at the DIA called Van Gogh in America. This exceptional exhibition at the DIA celebrates the 100th anniversary of the DIA becoming the first American museum to acquire a work by Vincent Van Gogh. Today's program will only offer a sample of the DIA's remarkable history and why the DIA is truly a treasure. Dave, do you want to start us off? I sure do. Thanks, Ray. And welcome, everyone. This is who we are today, always on the cutting edge. So let's take a look. And like Ian said, we hope that you will feel inspired and excited to visit the DIA soon. By the middle of the 19th century, Detroit had become the 25th largest city in the U.S. with a desire for like the cultural and social amenities of a large urban center, similar to those on the East Coast. The population of Detroit in 1880 was around 116,000, but by 1910, it had swelled to over 465,000. Newspaper magnate James E. Scripps, the founder of the Detroit Evening News saw the need for this public institution dedicated to visual arts. And, and so what had happened was the Art Loan Exhibition of 1883, vi uh, visually documented by Michigan artist uh, Gary Melchers, as you see in this image, received national attention, which uh, excited local citizens and resulted in the founding of the Detroit Museum of Art a few years later. This uh, 1883 exhibition included nearly 5,000 objects. And at the end of its six week run, almost 135,000 people had attended. Just wanted to show you, uh, here's a uh, quick photograph of the first building of the DIA. Notice the name. We were originally called the Detroit Museum of Art. And we'll come back to this. A list of 40 citizens was drawn up, each of whom pledged at least $1,000 each to the new museum, and which became a reality in 1885 when the governor of Michigan signed an act for the formation of corporations for the cultivation of art. The completed building for the Detroit Museum of Art was located on Jefferson Avenue and open to the public in September of 1888. It quickly outgrew the space, even after uh, annex space was added, as you can see, in 1894, 1897, and 1905. On the photograph on the right-hand side, notice that there are buildings to the back of that museum. 
on the left side of the image. The 1905 auditorium was often full to capacity as the popularity of the Detroit Museum of Art became a prime cultural center of the early 1900s. This building was torn down in 1960 to make way for the Chrysler Freeway. So to meet the needs of a growing collection, a new building was needed. Member of Arts Commission uh, architect Albert Kahn recommends French architect Paul Philippe Cray, uh, spelled C-R-E-T, but pronounced Cray, for the new museum's building plans. The organization of the galleries that was developed by Cray and William Valentiner, whom you'll hear about from Tana, was innovative in its arrangement. The plan was to group objects in a museum by cultural area rather than by medium, something that had never been done before. In fact, the design earned an entry in the 1929 Encyclopedia Britannica for innovations in design. In this slide, you can see a couple of images of the early designs of these galleries. Uh, the lower right, of course, is now enclosed, and that's the Kresge Court Cafe. Um, in 1919, um, the Detroit Museum of Art became the Detroit Institute of Arts following voter approval of a municipal uh, arts commission charged with managing a city-supported art museum. The DIA Arts Commission helped to steer the path of the museum's future in collecting. In 1920, the city of Detroit authorized funds for the new Woodward Cray building, as well as the purchase of artworks for the new space. Here we see uh, Arts Commission President Ralph Harmon Booth turning over the first spate of dirt at the new building. And this photo, if you notice, was dated June 22nd, 1922. And here we see another photo taken on June 22nd, 1922, after the first cornerstone was laid at our current 5200 Woodward Avenue address. Five years later, the Temple of Art, as it was referred to, opened on October 7th, 1927. Tana, take it away. All right. So the 1920s were seen as the DIA's golden age. And thanks to the support of the people you see on the slide before you and their leadership, that's Edsel Ford, Eleanor Ford, Robert Hudson Tannehill, and director William Valentiner, the DIA not only continues to thrive, but offers a world-class collection. Together, through donation and visionary curation, the four expanded the quality and variety of art acquisitions for the museum. Now I'm guessing the Ford name is familiar to everyone. Tannehill, maybe not so much. He was a member of the Hudson Department Store family and first cousin of Eleanor Clay Ford, which speaks to the family commitment to grow the museum's collection. William Valentiner, on my left, was a visionary director. And we can go to the next slide. Dr. William R. Valentiner was German born and educated in Europe. He was appointed in 1924 as the first director of the Detroit Institute of Arts following several years of working as the museum's consultant. He was the first thoroughly trained professional art historian to be employed by the DIA. From 1921 to 1924, Valentiner worked as a consultant for the DIA traveling to Europe to buy works of art in anticipation of the 1927 opening of the new DIA building on Woodward Avenue. Valentiner was also an art purchasing consultant to Ralph Booth, Edsel and Eleanor Ford, Robert Tannehill, and others on the Arts Commission in the acquisition of select artworks over his tenure at the DIA. Tana. Well, Tana, we are so fortunate that Valentiner was the first director, particularly at a time when the patrons in the city were ready to spend money on the collection. Um, he was, as you know, born in Germany and was actually, a high, before World War I, a highly respected curator at the Met. 
And when World War I started, he went back to Germany to fight with the Germans. And so after the war, he couldn't get a job in Germany because of the economy. No one in Europe would hire him. And he ended up, fortunately for us, at the DIA. Uh, the Met wouldn't take him back because of his allegiance to the Germans during the World War I. So um, that extraordinary set of circumstances is why so many treasures are at the museum. It's interesting how history unfolds itself. It certainly is. And you're right, we are lucky, at least art-wise. Um, his guidance and knowledge and foresight and art collecting was instrumental in choosing which pieces of art were purchased for the DIA, and many of our prized works were purchased under his guidance. He retired in 1945 at the age of 65, because that's when you had to retire at that time in the city of Detroit. And he went on to have a stellar career uh, working as the curator in the Los Angeles County Museum. And he passed away at the age of 78 in 1958. And we can go to our next collection. There you go. Uh, the DIA's collection truly is a national treasure. And here we have a slide that has one of Ray's favorites when I was studying his passion for Cotopaxi was very <laughs> evident, very exciting to all of us who were learning to be IPVs. There you go, it's right there in the center. Um, we also see Mushushu the dragon on this slide. We see Van Gogh's self-portrait. We see a Korean Buddha. Rivera Court. Bruegel's Wedding Dancer. And Helen Moore by Mario Moore. We can go to our next slide. And here we have the Vincent Van Gogh self-portrait. As Ray mentioned in his opening, it was the first work by this artist to enter a public museum in the United States. Up until then, there were Van Goghs with private collectors, but nothing in a museum. And this was a purchase that predates Valentiner's appointment as director. It was purchased at an NYC art auction by the president of the Arts Commission, Ralph Booth, in January of 1922 and added to the DIA's collection in February 1922 after the Arts Commission approved the purchase with the City of Detroit funds. It was purchased before the world appreciated Van Gogh's work, before it was popular. So the purchase was visionary and to me is impressive for that reason. And then on the other side, <clears throat> um, we have the window by Matisse. It was purchased at the same time <clears throat> And it was also the first Matisse to enter an American public collection. So DIA, was, they were pioneers in art collecting, and that's kind of exciting to me. Um, it was contemporary art in the 1920s, 1922, when it was purchased, and it was purchased only six years after it was created. Uh, Ralph Booth was credited with both of these purchases based on the sales records, telegrams, and letters to the DIA's then director, Clyde Burroughs. And then the next piece that we have is the wedding dance by Peter Bruegel the Elder. And we also have Mushushu here. Dr. Valentiner's skill in art purchases was so trusted that while traveling in Europe during 1930, he telegrammed the museum to ask for funds to purchase the important and rare wedding dance by Bruegel, which was for sale at a London art dealer's gallery. And the painting was dirty and overpainted at the time of purchase, but it's been cleaned up since. The overpainted areas have been restored to their original composition. And the DIA had a Bruegel exhibition in 2020 highlighting this painting. Uh, when Valentin, hey. sorry. I'm sorry, no, go ahead. Just finish what you're saying. I just wanted to mention something about this painting. Oh, so when Valentina phoned in and was like, hey, I have this awesome painting, the DIA didn't even hesitate. They trusted him that much. And it remains one of Valentiner's greatest or acquisitions. What were you going to say, Ray? Yeah, and at, just to emphasize that point, um, art historians and curators from around the world say that the DIA is a must stop because of this particular work, the, uh, the Rivera Court, and some of the other ones. But this was a particularly rare 
and historically important painting. And it's really um, wonderful that we have it at the DIA. I agree. It's fun painting too. And when you see it. Yeah, that. there's a lot of fun with this painting. <laughs> yeah. Um, what else was I going to say? His connections to German art museums also brought to the DIA what we have on the, my lower right. And that's the glazed terracotta tile piece, Mishushu the Dragon. And it comes from the Ishtar Gate of ancient Babylon, which is modern day Iraq. Specifically, it comes from the Pergamon Museum in Berlin. Well, that's where we got it from. That's not the origin story. Uh, and what happened was they had extra dragons, lions, and aurochs, which are known by most people as bulls. And after rebuilding the gate in their museum in 1930, the extra animals were sold to museums internationally. And the dragons, being held in high esteem, are in several museums, including the DIA and Turkey. And we can go to the next slide. There you go. Valentiner's vision of building a world-class collection for Detroit also brought Melancholy Woman by Picasso. This is an early Picasso for, from his rare blue period, and it was brought into the collection through a collecting partnership with the DIA patron that I mentioned earlier, Robin, Robert Hudson Tannehill. And on the right, we have something from our German Expressionist collection, and Valentiner's German background and friendships with the Expressionist artists helped us to secure a really large number of German Expressionist works, including this one, which is the Winter Landscape in Moonlight. And we have one of the finest collections of German Expressionist art in the world. And if you haven't seen it yet, I highly encourage you to come down because the colors, as you can see in this piece, are super bold, and there's just a lot of emotionality in the pieces. And for me personally, it's one of my favorite collections. So Ta that concludes. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Tana, they, uh, and what you can't get from this slide is that the thickness of the paint, the applications of the paints and the brush strokes and the textures that really fill out sort of the aesthetic quality of those paintings. Absolutely. Absolutely. I could stand in front of this piece for hours. I love I it. Much. It's considered one of the best of the Ger examples of German Expressionism. So we're very, again, very fortunate to have it at the museum. Yeah, I can see why. So, Christine, are there any questions? Not questions per se, but we have a couple of really nice comments on your presentation, uh, how the viewers are enjoying it, and also that the DIA is uh, a few folks' favorite place to go. Um, when they are in Detroit or when they lived in Detroit. So um, we, we have some fans out there today. Oh, terrific. That's awesome. Good. Yeah, it's awesome. Come back, guys. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> so no more questions. I believe I'm passing the mic to Joel. Okay. Thank you, Tana. Hi, everyone. Um, I now want to shift your attention to Rivera Court and the, the Detroit Industry Murals. So we begin with a look at the court as it originally appeared when the museum first opened in 1927. You see it there on the left. And of course, as Rivera Court appears today, there it is on the right. Next slide, please. And here is a closer look at the original space, uh, again, in 1927, as designed by architect Paul Craig. It was a garden court, a place in which visitors could relax and socialize. In 1932, uh, the room was transformed when Diego Rivera commenced painting his monumental murals. So how did the project come about? In 1931, while on a visit to San Francisco, Dr. William Valentiner met with Diego Rivera, who already had established himself as a world-renowned Mexican muralist. Valentina invited Rivera to come to Detroit to paint a series of murals depicting the city's rich industrial history, including, but not exclusively, the auto industry. And to our great fortune, Rivera accepted. The project was underwritten entirely by Etzel Ford, who is president of Ford Motor Company, as well as president of the Detroit Arts Commission at the time. 
So Rivera began his work in July of 1932, and he completed it nine months later in March of 1933. Next slide, please. Here we see our friend Rivera at work on one of the walls using a process called fresco painting. Uh, the process involves using special pigments which are applied to wet plaster and the chemistry here is that both the pigment and the plaster contain lime so in a sense one material dissolves into the other creating permanent images which are highly resistant to fading so uh, the paintings today look just as clear and just as vibrant as they did 90 years ago when rivera first created them next slide please now here we see the entire room it includes 27 panels covering the four walls of the court. With its Pan-American perspective, thematic richness, complexity of design, boldness of presentation, and vibrancy of color, the Detroit mural cycle has no peer in the history of modern art. In fact, Rivera himself once said that he considered it his very best work. And indeed, in 2014, it was designated as a National Historic Landmark. You know, Joel, people come, come from around the world to see those murals. Yeah. It is amazing. Detroit it's has a lot of great murals just in the city, too. It does, too. And um, part of the origin of that, not fully, is because his assistants and people would come and uh, to learn from him while he was doing it. And it really inspired artists, local artists, and some of his assistants who went on to the Public Works um, uh, Administration and to do murals all, all over the country. So his style really became um, popular and uh, really spread through America and Detroit too. Yeah, uh, that is so interesting, Ray. Thank you. Sure is. So um, let us move on from Rivera Court, as magnificent as it is, to another wonderful piece of architecture at the museum, the DIA's Performance Theater. It, too, was included in the original 1927 design and structure of the museum. It contained a Casavant pipe organ, one of the premier pipe organs of its time. Uh, musical and dramatic performances have graced the venue since its opening 95 years ago. And the theater has received numerous awards for its architecture, and it too is also on the National Registry of Historic Places. Next slide, please. Now, here we are introduced to a very important figure in the history of the DIA, Paul McFarlane. Who was he? He was a man in love with puppets. So to say he had an active fantasy life would be an understatement. Born here in Detroit in 1903, he became not only a puppeteer, but also a large collector of historically important puppets. In 1929, he founded the Marionette Fellowship of Detroit, and he went on to become a national dynamic force in the recognition of puppetry as a form of entertainment. Hmm. After his passing in 1948 from a brain tumor, the family donated his entire collection of over 500 puppets to the museum. Next slide, please. The donation of the McFarland puppets inspired an abundance of puppet-focused activity under the guidance of Mr. Audley Grossman, named the first director of performing arts for the DIA in 1960. Under his guidance, the music, excuse me, the museum expanded its offerings beyond the impressive paintings, sculptures, and decorative arts which adorn its halls to include a wide variety of performing arts, a tradition that lives on to this very day. So always thinking outside the box, Mr. Grossman in 1982 brought together for the first time on stage, two of the master puppeteers of the time, a gentleman by the name of Burr Tilstrom 
the creator of Kukla, Fran, and Ollie. And of course, Jim Hansen, who you see on the right here, the creator of the Muppets. <laughs> so uh, that's a wonderful picture you see there. And now I would like to turn the proceedings over to Dave. Dave, if you would. Yeah, thanks, Joel. And just to remind everybody too, we do have one of the original Kermits um, as well as Howdy Doody. So, you know, we'll look to see when those are coming back out on view. Um, so upon his death in 1969, Robert Tannehill left the DIA with 557 works of art and the largest single endowment fund for the purchase of art ever given to the museum. Prior to his death, with his approval, this endowment has been used to support staff salaries during lean economic times for the DIA. And throughout his decades at the museum, he worked closely with the founder, uh, Ralph Harmon Booth and Edsel Ford, in developing the collection and character of the museum, which you've probably heard before. He also traveled frequently with Valentiner to purchase art for the museum and to expand his private collection. Now, to me, that's a great trip, right? Buying something for a great <laughs> museum and buying something for yourself. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, wasn't that a when, big when are you ready, Dave? Let's go. <laughs> right, 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 I'm right. coming. <laughs> All right, let's go. We're on a shopping trip. I'm there. With somebody uh, else's money. <laughs> exactly. Well, we'll do the museum portion. I thought well. Dave was taking us. Ah. Um, you know what? I, I need to add to my collection. Absolutely. Um, he also served as honorary curator of American art for many years and was instrumental in founding the first auxiliary, the Friends of Modern and Contemporary Art. And you can find his name on several labels inside the museum. This slide uh, is, is a, just a small sample, right, of 557 plus additional artworks that he gave prior. And we see some of the works that he gave, these two amazing pieces by Vincent van Gogh, you know, the diggers on the left and then Bank of the Waz on the right hand side, which are both in the exhibition when you come down and see the uh, van Gogh exhibition, as well as the, the pointillist painter Georges Seurat. And you'll notice that the paint, uh, the frame is actually painted. And we're excited and grateful that uh, Tannehill saved that frame when he donated the painting to the museum because most collectors threw those original frames away. Very fortunate. Well, of course, expansion was needed for the DIA's growing collection. And then eventually we had outgrown the 1927 building space and required actually two additions. On the top, um, the South Wing was built in 1966 and then another one uh, in 1971. And you'll notice, too, that they, they were originally uh, made of black marble, setting against the white marble of the original building. And next slide. And then here we are in 1968. Well, Sam Wagstaff joins the uh, staff of the DIA as curator of contemporary art, bringing some significant new vitality. He was particularly interested in uh, Detroit's cast corridor artists, an audience that was previously ignored uh, by the DIA. He was also deeply connected to the art scene in New York City, which is where he moved to after leaving the museum. He encouraged exploration by artists in the forefront of contemporary art. He left the museum a short time later in 1971, and those who remained had the feeling that they had witnessed a kind of revolution, a new vision for the role of curator. He stands out as being innovative and interested in art as it was being created by artists, right? Not artists that lived two, three, four hundred thousand years ago. He, can, he made contemporary art of his own time come alive for the institution and the visitor since the late 60s. He also added key works to the contemporary collection, including Mark D. Severo's Tom, which you see that sculpture there, a piece from his own private collection which the museum purchased from him. Now, Tom is currently off view as the uh, contemporary galleries are being reinstalled. In 1974, 1974, <laughs> Elliot Wilhelm was named He's curator of film and is <laughs> instrumental in the DFT. We refer to it as DFT, the Detroit Film Theater. And he's instrumental to, to this day 
Over 3,100 films have shown, been shown to over 2 million visitors over its long history. The Film Theater is one of the longest running art house theaters in the U.S. And during uh, the, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, Wilhelm offered some films for home viewing through the DIA website and the, as well as the Thursdays at the museum like this. The, the DFT, the Film Theater, is now back open to the public again and films can be seen every weekend at the museum. Yeah, 48 years. That's <laughs> amazing. So it's Art House Theater, you said it's one of the longest. What does that mean exactly? Well, like longest continuous Art House run, it didn't close. So is Art House a type, like non-commercial type of film? Museum associated uh, theater. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, Thanks. yep. Right. Okay. And then in 1976, we said a final goodbye to our dear friend and long standing patron, Eleanor Clay Ford, you know, widow of Edsel Ford. Her gift of $1 million was used to establish a department devoted to the display and collection of African, oceanic, and New World art. And this gift followed 50 years of unflagging support in which she and uh, her uh, late husband Edsel donated 440, uh, excuse me, 141 works of art by many of the masters like Fra Angelico, Pablo Picasso, Van Gogh, and Hans Holbein. In fact, this nearly four foot tall fan favorite, the nail figure, is an early example of what the don her donated funds were able to acquire for our museum. It really is a fan favorite. Don't you love touring that? I do. Uh, I right, do. Tana? I mean, yeah. Visitors, yeah, it's a really. I feel like there's a little bit of magic around that there one. Is. There, there is. There is. The way they light it in the gallery. In the and if you gallery. stand correctly in the next gallery further down, you stand correctly, those shells on the eyes do reflect the light. <laughs> yes. There Maybe a night at the museum. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I've noticed that it's a favorite for children, too. Sure. Yeah, it's like looking at that absolutely. one. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a delightful picture. I mean, painting, painting, sculpture. Excuse sculpture, me. actually. Yeah. Sculpture, exactly. I, wonderful. You. Okay. So we'll go on to the next one. In 1988, the museum cleaned the Detroit Industry murals for the first time since they were completed in 1933. Gentle soap and water is all that was needed to clean the fresco walls. And here we have Diego Rivera's. Uh, mural work assistant, Stephen Dimitrov, uh, who came back to Detroit with his wife, Lucianne Block, to oversee the uh, effort and to assist in the cleaning process. An interesting fact, Lucianne uh, Block was also an assistant and best friend to Frida Kahlo, Diego's uh, third wife, who was in town while uh, Diego Rivera was working on the murals. Uh, additionally, we added uh, new UV protective skylights uh, to the ceiling uh, to replace the old glass, and the ceiling beams were painted. And lastly, new poabic tile flooring was installed to match the already present poabic tiles that are in the Great Hall. And then, in, uh, so the DIA's Native American collection of objects, you know, that were originally made and used for utilitarian, ceremonial, and personal use is greatly enhanced by donations from two collectors. And we refer to it as the Chandler Port Collection. The DIA's collection of 19th century Native American objects is comprised of North American woodlands, prairie, plains cultures, as well as Michigan cultures, including Ojibwe and Chippewa. The, the Chandler Port Collection resulted from the efforts of two men, Milford Chandler and Richard Port, whose early childhood fascination with the Native American frontier past had evolved into a deep and comprehensive collecting of Native American objects, and which were seated, of course, deeply in their respective cultures. Neither man was wealthy, nor did they work through the museum sponsorship, but they traveled extensively in the early 20th century, buying and trading uh, with Native American nations for these desired pieces. 
and of course, you know, objects like like the man's shirt would rotate all the time because textiles need to rotate due to their sensitivity to light and humidity. So that bear claw necklace is amazing when it's on view. It it's really, a, it's it really clean. is, right? It probably stands like at least fifteen inches. Yeah, it's it's, uh, it's quite impressive. Yeah, I want one. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh, Tana? Right. Nice job, Dave. Uh, yeah, 1999 brings us to the DIA's 10th director, Graham Beale. And prior to joining, just prior to joining the DIA, he served as the director of the Los Angeles County Museum from 96 to 99. And he presided so, over some of the most significant accomplishments in the museum's history, including a tremendously successful reinvention of presenting art to the public. In 1999, under his direction, the DIA collaborated with performance artist and poet Yoko Ono to bring her installation Freight Train to the DIA's South Lawn. And you see the image before you. The installation featured a train car riddled with bullet holes, playing music written and recorded by Ono. The train was conceptualized as a way to draw attention to violence directed toward those who are trying to enter the country illegally. There's a label in the lower right-hand corner of the picture, and that had a poem on it written by Yoko Ono, and you can't see it, but it says, a work of atonement for the injustice and pain we've experienced in this century, expressing resistance, healing, and hope for the future. Autumn 1999, Yoko Ono. The DIA owns additional Yoko Ono pieces, and we have at least one of her works up right now. It's one to honor the, uh, the unfortunate assassination of her husband, John Lennon. Oh, is it's, that what's up right yeah, now? It's a, yeah, it's, a, um, it's not a, his original shirt, but it's based upon his original sh shirt, presented right. in an extremely thoughtful Powerful. way. Yeah, it really is. It's in the contemporary galleries. Powerful. Um, thanks. Thanks for sharing that. Oh, that's no problem. Yeah. Um, okay, so this next slide that you have before you, these are a few of the exhibits that Beale was responsible for bringing to the DIA. We had another Van Gogh in 2000. We also had Rembrandt and the Face of Jesus, which was a collaboration between DIA, the Louvre, and the Philadelphia Museum. And then upper right, we have five, we had five Spanish masterpieces. Um, and that was from the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the Met in New York, the Kimball Museum in Fort Worth, and the Museo del Prado in Spain. We can go to our next. There you go. So you heard before that Eleanor Ford donated $1 million. Uh, we also had um, a huge amount of money donated from the G from GM for the Center for American Art, and that was in 2000. Um, and the DIA created a suite of galleries devoted to the display and scholarship of African American art. Valerie Mercer was named the curator and expanded the collection that we already had with contemporary pieces. And those include works by Kahindi Wiley. We have an awesome, awesome Kahindi Wiley. And most of you probably already know this, but I get excited every time I talk about it. Kahindi <laughs> Wiley is the artist who painted Obama, um, the, the Obama portrait that is on display in the National Museum. This collection also has pieces by Michalene Thomas, um, and they're both young and actively working artists. And this is exciting to me too. DIA was the first American museum with a worldwide collection of galleries that were devoted exclusively to African American art. In 2004, because the DIA is so dedicated to Detroit and the people of Detroit and the goal of serving the people of Detroit, and because the DIA really wanted to make a visitor-centered experience, during the renovation, the DIA used visitor panels 
made up of average visitors, non-visitors, diverse groups to help inform our installation and interpretation panels. And so as a result of their input, we have thematic installations. We have wall panels that avoid the typical stiff museum jargon. We have interactive installations, videos, and things like iSpy. And all of those are meant to help visitors feel empowered and really connected to the objects and the areas of our art collection. So after all the renovation in 2007, the new DIA opened, and we have a slide for that. There we go. It took seven years to construct, and it gave the museum even more gallery space, and that allowed for the innovator, innovative visitor-centered installations and also a temperature-stabilized environment that would protect the art. As part of the 2007 reopening, the original, one of the original castings, oh, there we go, awesome, there, okay, you can see it, the thinker right in the middle. One of the original castings of Rodin's thinker was moved to its current spot and the Woodward Avenue, there we go, entrance. And during that grand reopening in 2007, we had nearly 58,000 visitors come in just a 48 hour period. And the lines you can see were super long. Everybody was excited to see the new galleries. The DIA remained open for 32 hours straight. And even overnight, they were open. In 2009, the city was on fire, okay? In a good way. In 2009, the Gallery of Islamic Art opened. And this gallery is dedicated to the exhibition of Islamic art. And that meets a need for the large Arab American community in Detroit. It was installed and interpreted to assist visitors who have little or no understanding of Islamic arts and culture. And it helps all visitors to understand that Islamic art is more than works about religion. It shows arts from lands under Islamic governance. We it's, also- It's sorry. beautiful. It's gorgeous in there. The art it is- just wonderfully uh, beautiful. It's not just decorative, it's just really beautiful. Um, a lot of pe different pieces. Those yeah. rugs, you, that, that large rug you see there, they, um, they have to rotate it often and one after the other is more beautiful. Yeah, they, they're so gorgeous. I want those too. I'm <laughs> well, maybe Dave will take you shopping for one. There we right. go. Bye, Dave. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Um, in this collection, we also have a really unique section that is devoted to the sacred writings, and that shows texts from Muslim, Christian, and Jewish sources, and it shows how they influenced each other. And it also includes video of the contemporary Islamic calligrapher Muhammad Zakaria, and the purpose of that video is to demonstrate the complexity and intricacy of Islamic calligraphy. So um, in 2012, we continued to use visitor studies to help strengthen our special exhibition interpretation. All special exhibitions were created with consideration to visitors and their interests. And the visitor panel studies invited people from the community to contribute their ideas in regard to each specific exhibition. And we also ended up winning the top prestigious prize for excellence in exhibition, thanks to everyone from Detroit and their input. You know, the group IQ is better, higher than the individual. And we won that award from the American Association of Museums. And that was for the Through African Eyes, the European in African Art, 1500 to the present. And part of that collection was the throne that you see before you. In 2009, the chief's throne was installed in the African galleries on the first floor of the DIA. The throne hadn't previously been displayed because a special base had to be created. So yes, under Director Beale, the DIA continued its legacy of expansion and innovation. And you're gonna hear about even more progress from Joel, except I think Ray has something he wanted to say. Oh, no, I just wanted to say, and Dave uh, and Tana, maybe Joel too, that's just one piece of wood that that's carved from. Isn't that correct? Yes. And it's, just, and it's unbelievable that that particular artist 
who we have three or four of his amazing pieces of, is so talented to be able to, to carve out of the available wood he had, the, these amazing specimens. And we have, I think, four of his pieces up currently, um, which are just precious. They're very good. I agree. Powerful work. Extraordinary. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right, Joel, you're going to take us home. I will. I will. Thank you. Thank you, Ray and Tana, and uh, for your insights there. So what I'm going to talk about here is uh, in 2012, Wayne Oakland and Macomb County residents voted to support a millage to help stabilize the DIA's uh, financial position. Now, commensurate with the public, with that public support, the museum established a strategic goal to become a quote unquote visitor centered institution. It would accomplish this through community outreach, education and engagement, providing meaningful and creative programs to a variety of groups. Next slide, please. So as an example of its commitment to community outreach, the DIA established its Inside Out initiative. Uh, the program brings high quality reproductions of popular and iconic paintings from the museum's collection to outdoor venues throughout greater Detroit and surrounding areas. Many residents, including those of you watching today, have seen these pieces at public parks, school campuses, or numerous other popular locations. Next slide, please. Um, the DIA is more than a museum, it's a classroom. Reflecting the Institute's commitment to education, it hosts numerous field trips of students from schools throughout Michigan. Because of additional tax dollars provided by the millage in the Tri-County area, Wayne, Oakland, and Macomb counties, not only is admission free for students from these communities, but the DIA also offers free bus transportation for field trips. So as a result, since 2012, the museum has hosted literally hundreds of thousands of students through its doors. Um, for example, uh, in, uh, in just in fiscal year 2018 and 2019, Right before COVID hit, we saw over 70,000 students visit the halls of the museum, which of course is quite an impressive number. Next slide, please. And in addition to student groups, the DIA coordinates enrichment programs for seniors, often at no charge. Since 2012, many thousands of seniors have visited the museum frequently with the assistance of free transportation. Uh, next slide. And here's another slide showing seniors participating in art activities here at the museum. Yeah, and I want to say, Cadet Joel, if I could say, you know, with the, with the studio there, uh, hopefully, and I'm not sure if they're back on yet, but we had drop-in workshops on the weekend where anybody can drop in. They, uh, they are. They're back. They are back up. Yeah, so yeah. you could drop in and create art and take it with you uh, on, uh, you know. Uh, about yeah it's a great place to stop if you've got a family and kids but even as adults if you want to have an inspirational moment or want to get creative you can always stop in there uh, during the hours that they're running it usually in the afternoon for those mm. drop-in workshops it yeah. could be a good date yeah there you go <laughs> there you go and you could you, you could see if you really are meant for each other over the uh art you create right, right? yeah Hey, that's a good point, though, Dave. It, uh, programming, a lot of the programming is finally back after the COVID closures and everything. Right. Else. And you're right. And that's a delightful thing, particularly for a family activity. Yes. And, you know, and I wanted to say, too, some some communities, when they have the inside out uh, pieces, are offering tours. And we get asked to do those tours of the pieces that are outside on display. So when, if you see those in your in your city, and uh, maybe ask around and find out if they're having uh, tours available. All really good points. Okay, thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. I'm learning stuff here too. Um, <laughs> hey, Ray, it's uh, your turn. You're going to handle the next slide, which is to talk about the uh, Detroit bankruptcy and the role the DIA played in that whole that whole story. 
Yeah, no, my pleasure, Joel. So the DIA was dragged into the city of Detroit bankruptcy, not because of the museum's financial situation, but because creditors of the city targeted art in the DIA's collection to be supposed city assets that could be liquidated to satisfy the city's debts. Fortunately, those creditors did not prevail, and through a compromise known as the Grand Bargain, works from the DIA's collection were not sold for the benefit of creditors. The Grand Bargain consisted of various corporations and foundations and individuals contributing hundreds of millions of dollars to a fund that went to satisfy the various debts of the city of Detroit. The judicial proceedings concerning the approval of the grand bargain included a court-ordered approval of an arrangement that protects the DIA's collection from any future claims of creditors of the city of Detroit. So that circumstance uh, will not happen again, which is a relief, obviously, for us art lovers. Joel, let me turn it back to you. All right. Thank you, Ray. So um, scholarship is an essential part of the work of the museum. And we continue to examine and in many cases re-examine items in the collection, bringing new scholarship and insight to our understanding of them. So here's a fascinating example of what I'm talking about. Since the 1960s, this mummy you see here was thought to be that of a woman but not so fast. Uh, using X radiography during an examination performed by a forensic pathologist, pathologist in 2014, we now believe the mummy to be a male aged 25 to 40 years old. So there you go. Now, um, Tana talk, uh, explained a number of things about Graham Beale, former director Graham Beale. And again, just to uh, summarize uh, the many innovations and improvements and new directions of the past 20 years uh, were initiated under his dynamic leadership. And again, he retired in 2015. So next slide, please. In September of 2015, Dr. Salvador Salor Pons began his tenure as the 11th director of the DIA. He was previously the museum's curator of European paintings. He is a native of Madrid, Spain, and holds a doctorate in art history, among other numerous degrees. Dr. Salor Pons is deeply committed to continuing the work of his predecessor in fostering a visitor-centered environment at the Institute. He supports community outreach and looks to create new partnerships statewide. And he supports a uh, let's call it a town square concept at the Institute, a place where people can gather to enjoy the art, the buildings, and all the grounds surrounding the museum. And here is a quote from our director, quote, after all these years working at the DAA, I feel deeply connected to Detroit, especially through the role the museum has played as part of the city's extraordinary history, unquote. Next slide, please. Um, I'm going to talk now about a couple galleries that opened in the past decade. In November of 2017, the newly installed Gallery of Japanese Art was opened. Celebrating the rich history of Japanese art, the gallery features traditional masterpieces alongside contemporary objects. Visitors can explore the complementary qualities of stillness and movement inherent in so many Japanese artworks. And according to director Salor Pons, the idea we present in this gallery will connect with people of every background and bring the beauty and significance of Japanese artistic and cultural practices to all visitors. Next slide, please. And uh, Tana, spoke earlier about the Asian galleries. Um, the DIA inaugurated the expansion of its Asian galleries in November of 2018. With over 7,000 objects in its collections, the galleries, which uh, are listed here in the slide, represent a diverse range of cultural traditions and art making spanning more than 8,000 years. Objects include paintings, ceramics, textiles, sculpture, glasswork, 
and Arts of the Book. Visitors are invited to imagine the objects in their original context and spaces, such as tea rooms or Buddhist temples, or perhaps domestic rooms. So I would now like to turn the present presentation over to Ray to take us to the conclusion. Well, Ray. I will. And before I do, uh, thank you, Joel and Dave and Tana, the excellent presentations. It's always been a pleasure working with all of you. Likewise. So, yeah, absolutely. Wonderful presentations. Thank you. Thank so you. this concludes our presentation concerning the history of, of the DIA. We encourage each of you to visit the museum. The DIA is committed to creating experiences that help each visitor find personal meaning in art individually and with each other. Ian, could you, thank you. Um, the museum is open every day, but Mondays and certain holidays. Admission is free for residents of Wayne, Macomb, and Oakland counties. The museum currently has extended hours to accommodate the Van Gogh in America exhibition, so there's ample opportunity to visit. The Van Gogh in America exhibition truly is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. There are 76 Van Gogh works from around the world. Many are among Van Gogh's most famous paintings, and eight of them are from private collections, so you may never get the chance to see these works again. You can purchase tickets for the exhibition online. The exhibition runs through January 22nd. It will not be presented in any other museum. This is the one and only stop. Be sure, be sure to get tickets so you, your family and friends can enjoy this remarkable event. So this concludes the last streaming virtual live tour led by IPVs or volunteer docents for the DIA's Thursdays at the Museum program. We started this virtual tour programming in March 2020 at the height of the COVID closures and the museum's own closure. They were intended as an avenue to provide our community an opportunity to stay connected with the DIA and its remarkable collection. On behalf of all the docents who have presented during these virtual live tours, it has been our pleasure to share our passion for art our, and our love for of the DIA. We want to thank the director of the IPV or Dosen program, Christine Mark, for her remarkable guidance in developing and facilitating this program. We also want to thank Kathleen McBroom for her support with the PowerPoint today and many times in the past. I personally also want to thank my close docent colleague, Howard Rosenberg, who is one of the founding members of this program, a delight to work with, and a good friend. We hope that these virtual live tours have inspired you to visit the DIA and have a greater appreciation of the treasures housed there. It is, as we've been saying, a friendly, visitor-centered place that strives to make each visitor feel at home. We docents are in the museum daily to give tours and engage with visitors. We sincerely hope to see all of you at the museum. So for now, all the best. Thanks so much and good afternoon. <laughs>